technology program and we're going to talk about doing that blood pressure that you may or may not have to do when you get to clinic. Now what you have in front of you there is you'll have a stethoscope and a cuff and we'll get into that in just a minute and you've got some instructions for actually doing a blood pressure and we're going to go over all of that. But before we start I want to give you a few definitions uh, that pertain to doing a blood pressure. First of all, who can tell me what high blood pressure is? What's the term, the medical term for it? Hypertension. 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 And that's what you're going to see uh, if you're looking at a request or a chart in a clinic. They're going to say hypertension. They're going to typically not going to say high blood pressure. Now, there are two figures that you're going to see written that's going to tell you a patient's blood pressure or if you have to record a blood pressure, you record it with two figures. Uh, does anybody know what those figures are called? Systolic, systolic and, and diastolic. And which one is the top number? Systolic. systolic. Very good. And the bottom one is going to be your diastolic reading. Now, what do, does anybody know what the uh, the current <coughs> definition, if you will, for high blood pressure is. In other words, what's a reading that's considered to be high blood pressure? Over 120. I'm sorry, what? Is it the top number over 120? It's going to be typically 140 over 90. Now, if that pressure is sustained, in other words, it's not just a one-time occurrence, then this patient is typically said to have high blood pressure or hypertension. Now, uh, to just a little bit further define the terms systolic and diastolic for you. Systolic uh, indicates how hard the heart is working. Okay, that's your top number, how hard the heart is working. The bottom reading, your diastolic pressure, is an indicator of what's known as peripheral resistance. In other words, um, pressure within the arteries at rest. So I gave you the numbers for uh, high blood pressure, 140 over 90. Now how about uh, normal? That's going to be systolic, 95 to 139. 95 to 139. Diastolic is 60 to 89. So you can have a range, a range of numbers. Now you can also have low blood pressure, and that would be a reading of 95 over 60. Um, that's a typical reading of someone with, with low blood pressure. Now, if that diastolic number is about 50, then this patient may be getting ready to go into shock. You've all heard of shock. I know that. Had enough blood loss so that your blood pressure has dropped enough so that the, uh, the body's organs may be are reaching a critical state. So 50 or below is a sort of a danger level. Okay, so there's some info about uh, the blood pressure. So why don't you open up your cuff now and let's take a look at, um, I didn't get one for us. Let's look at the component parts, the anatomy of a stethoscope if you will, and a blood pressure cuff. Okay. Technically speaking, this is a 
sphygmomanometer. A sphygmomanometer. We just typically call it a cup. Somebody will say, go get a cup off the crash cart. This is what they want you to do is pull up a blood pressure cup. And there are several different kinds of uh, sphygmomanometers. This kind that you see here is known as an aneroid type. You use air to um, register uh, the reading on your dial. And this is what's on most crash cards or in most departments. This is the type that you will see most commonly. Now also, how many of you have been to the doc and gotten your um, ex physical exam done and they used a digital unit? Most of you probably. Those are notoriously inaccurate. <laughs> so hopefully uh, they got the right blood pressure reading for you when you had that done. Now, the third kind is called a mercury manometer. Uh, this is uh, the most accurate type. Uh, it uses air to inflate a column of mercury, but we don't use them anymore because EPA considers this an environmental hazard. And if you break the mercury column, then the guys in the little white suits come out and have to clean up the area. So you're not going to see any of these anymore, but it is considered the type that is the most accurate. All right, so let's look at your um, cuff for just a minute. Now then, kind of open this up just a little bit and feel in here. You can feel the bladder. This is the thing that puts pressure on the arm, on the, the vessel when you blow it up. So this is the bladder. You also have a gauge. Here's the gauge that's going to give you the reading when you put the pressure on the, the vessel. And then you have the pump, the hand pump. And then there's a valve that opens and closes the hand pump. Now, as far as I'm concerned, in doing a blood pressure, operating your valve appropriately is the hardest part of taking a blood pressure. If you open this too much, it's going to let the air out too rapidly and you can get an inaccurate reading. Or if you let your air out too slowly, it can also give you an inaccurate reading. So it's, it's a fine line that you have to walk to learn to do this properly. So here's the parts of the cup. So let's look at the stethoscope look at the parts of that. <clears throat> All right, the first thing are going to be the earpieces, and you always want to clean your earpieces before you use them and when you finish. Now, if you're the only person in the department that's ever going to use these, or these are your, this is your own personal stethoscope, if you forget to clean it, so what? But who knows who's going to come in behind you and use these and then put them back and not clean them. So always clean these as soon as you get through and before you use them. The other little rule that go with earpieces is that they should always point forward in your ears. That's the way your ear canal is, is situated in your head. And if you have them in the wrong direction, what's going to happen is that you're going to obscure the little holes here and you're not going to be able to hear. So always make sure that the earpieces point forward. Okay, the other thing that you have is the diaphragm. This is the big part, and this is the part that you're going to use to do the pressure. And then you have a bell. Now this is for other reasons other than taking a blood pressure, so we don't use this much. Now one thing that I haven't uh, mentioned yet is that you can turn this stethoscope on and off uh, and there's probably a couple of different ways to do this the one that I have here 
has got a, uh, a lever on it that you just push up and pull back, and that turns it on and off. Uh, some of the others, I think, just twist. Let's see who's got one here. I think you've probably got a twist. Yeah, the head just twists on here to turn it on and off. The whole thing just twists. Now, how do you determine whether or not your stethoscope is on? Put it in your ears, and then what do you do? Don't tap. <laughs> Rub. Rub the surface of the diaphragm. Uh, if you tap, you're probably going to end up hitting it with a fingernail, and you'll know whether or not it's on, but you'll also know just by rubbing. So that's one of the things we're going to do uh, when we start this. Okay, any questions about the anatomy of the cuff or the uh, <coughs> It's pretty simple. All right, so let's look at how to do this. I want to walk you through this, and then uh, each one of you are going to get a chance to try it. Wash your hands. Now, hopefully you will have time to do this, but obviously if this is going to be in an emergency situation, I don't expect you to run out and wash your hands and then go get the stethoscope and the cup and start taking a pressure. Doesn't that make sense? Okay. So cleanliness whenever possible. Uh, the, the next thing says explain the procedure. Now if your patient is at least halfway conscious, conscious you need to explain the procedure. Let them know what's happening. Even if you are not sure how conscious they are, you need to tell them what you're going to do. Okay? So explain. You may have to work while you're explaining, but uh, explain. Uh, the next point, your earpieces are cleaned and the diaphragm is turned on. Earpieces are in place correctly. Remember I told you those need to face forward. Your patient is comfortable. Now likely your patient is going to be reclining uh, and so they should, should be comfortable. Um, the next thing to do is expose the side. In other words, pull up the sleeve uh, so that you can get to the antecubital area. Um, if the patient is seated, you want to try and keep the arm at the level of the patient's heart. If they are recumbent on the couch, then the arm will be at the proper level. Uh, the next thing that you want to do, if you have the option, is to choose the appropriate size cuff. Uh, most of your departments are going to have this size cuff right here is for pretty much an average arm. But someone that has a very tiny arm, uh, you should use a smaller cuff if you can. Um, if you have someone with a very large arm, you need a larger cuff. Um, so try to choose an appropriate size cuff. If you use the wrong size cuff, what do you think is going to happen to your reading? It's going to be inaccurate going to be in that. Okay, so to take this uh, blood pressure, you've got to place your diaphragm uh, over the brachial artery in the antecubital space. So what I want us to do right now is to see if we can locate the brachial artery. It's going to be in the bend of the elbow towards the medial side. You're going to have to push down to see if you can find it. If you can find it on yourself, you're probably able to find it on someone else. How we do it? I got mine. Okay. How many of you have got it located? A bunch of you? Okay, then when you locate it, I want you to reach over to your partner and see if you can locate it on them. <laughs> <laughs> Locating the brachial artery is important because this is how you know where to place the head of your stethoscope. Now, here's the deal. You don't want the stethoscope, the head of the stethoscope, 
up under the cup. Now, I've had it done that way for me, uh, and you're going to see it done. But the only thing about it is, is that cuff is going to rub on this, and it's going to create extraneous noise for you. And if you're not really good at taking blood pressure, you're not going to get an accurate pressure because you can't separate out the extraneous noise from the blood pressure uh, beat. So here's how you do it. You need to make sure that your, the bottom edge of the cuff is one to two inches above the antecubital space. Okay? So get that cuff on up under the arm high enough so that the bottom of it is going to strike the arm just about right here. Then that's going to give you enough room to place your stethoscope without putting it up under the cuff. Okay, the next thing that you want to do is place the arrow that you see on your cuff over the brachial artery. Yours may have some other type of indicator on there, but you should have something on your cuff that's going to tell you where to place the cuff appropriately. What they're trying to do essentially is center the bladder over the brachial artery. You want to make sure that the cuff is snug. You shouldn't be able to put your hand up under that cuff if it's tight enough. So make sure that it's on there snugly. Then the next thing is talking about placing the head of the stethoscope up. As I told you, you don't want to have this up under the cuff. So you want to place this so that it's not under the cuff. You don't want your tubing to be any more overlapped than is absolutely necessary because again, you're going to, the tubing's going to rub together as your patient breathe or if you're a little nervous you may cause the tubing to shake and rub together and this is going to create extraneous noise that you're going to have difficulty separating from the beat of the heart and then obviously you want this centered over the brachial artery okay you got the cuff on you got this in place the next thing that you're going to do is make sure that your valve is closed and I'm right-handed, so for me, when the valve is closed, it's rolled away from me, away from me. To open it, I roll it towards me. So you're just going to have to try this yourself and see how it works. So make sure your valve is closed. It tells you you want to inflate the cuff quickly. 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury above the expected systolic reading. Well, you may not have any clue what that systolic reading is. So the quick way to do it is run it up to 180 and listen with your stethoscope and see if you hear a beat, if you hear a sound. If you don't, then you can start letting your out, air out slowly and listen for your first sound. Okay, so I'm getting ahead of myself just a little bit. Uh, where it says inflate the cuff quickly, it tells you you need to do this less than seven seconds, no more than seven seconds to do the inflation. Then open your valve smoothly with your thumb and your forefinger. This has got to be a one-handed action. You've got to learn to do this with one hand. You can't hold the bulb and then open one-handed. You want to deflate this at the rate of two to three millimeters of mercury per second. Two to three millimeters of mercury per second. And that tells you here again, I've already mentioned this, if you let the air out too fast, you'll get a false low reading. If you're too slow, you're going to get a false high reading. So the air is coming out. You want to note the reading where you hear the very first sound. Then you also want to keep listening and listening and listening until you hear what? The last sound, okay? Then there's one other thing that may not be mentioned in your text, and I'm not sure exactly what it says about this, but it is important for you to listen for 10 millimeters of mercury below where you think you've heard the last sound. 
because sometimes people have a diastolic that will sweep in after you think you've heard the last sound. Well, so you need to listen for 10 more points after you think you've heard your last sound to make sure that you have indeed got that last sound. So once you've got those numbers recorded in your mind, release the pressure on the cuff, just open up the, the valve, let the air out, uh, get the patient comfortable. Then you want to clean off your earpieces and wash your hands when you're through. Now, every now and then, you think you've got to reinflate because you're just not quite sure about that reading. The very last sentence here, you've got to totally deflate the cuff and wait 15 to 30 seconds before reinflating because this pressure against the vessel is going to cause an irritation, perhaps even a spasm, so that you're not going to get a good reading. So 15 to 30 seconds if you have to reinflate. Okay, any questions? If not, let's give it a whirl. Are you ready for them to start? Mm -hmm. Okay.